All right, everyone. So it is noon here at One Schoolhouse on Wednesday. So we are going to get started. Today, I have with me Kareen Dadini, our Assistant Head of School for Teaching and Learning, who is going to talk about online learning is still here to say, stay, but we've got some different, different takes on that today. So just as a reminder, I want to remind everybody on our blog, Kareen has asked a, really some great questions for academic leaders to consider at their schools. And next week webinar, we're gonna talk about technology, which is always fun for me. We're gonna talk about where it saved us and where it let us down over the last few months. Um, I'll give you a hint, if you are a science fiction fan, Ready Player One is not quite uh, ready for prime time yet. <laughs> <laughs> if you're not a science fiction fan, you're like, what is she talking about? But, so that I think will be a fun conversation. Um, just a reminder that the Advanced Independent Curriculum is live and ready for schools to use, so you can download that. And coming up soon will be even more um, resources involving that. And then we've got some Summer PD. If you are interested in exploring Advanced Independent Curriculum at your school, we'd love to have you join us. We've got some other PD coming this summer. We've got what I'm calling the restorative. How do we think about um, really moving into the next normal this summer? And how do we do it in a way that restores us after the exhaustion? Karina and I are gonna talk about that a little bit more too. And then back by popular demand is our building trust course for academic leaders on how to have healthy conversations with faculty and help them reconnect and feel agency and ownership if they've had had a rough time. So that is all there. And then I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I have another slide up here that I'm going to share later on as we go, Kareen. So looking forward to that. So Kareen, um, you wrote a piece. Actually, just tell everybody a little bit about you and your work in case this is their first time coming to one of the One Schoolhouse webinars. And I should have introduced myself. I'm Sarah Hanawalm, Assistant Head of School and the Wednesday host of these webinars. Hi, folks. Thanks for being here. I'm Kareen Dadini. I oversee teaching and learning on our student side of the house here at One Schoolhouse. And um, I am increasingly interested in how much families and students missed being on campus. And so I think Sarah and I will probably kind of meander into that space today and then um, wander back to the intersection of what draws kids and families to independent schools and why that's so important and um, so vibrant. And then how online learning still intersects with and actually probably supports that work. Okay. Great, thank you. So Kareem, last fall, you and I were right here in this same space talking about online learning is here to say, stay. And now we're saying the same thing, but we have a lot more perspective. You just mentioned how much families and students are missing um, brick and mortar school. We also know about our older learners, those in high school, and what has helped those who have thrived in online learning. So Kareen, you wrote on our blog about the questions academic leaders should ask about online learning. And one of the things that really struck me was, where did we see innovations that increased inclusivity and belonging? And what I immediately thought about is that these innovations don't happen just by happenstance, right? So can you tell us a little bit more about the intentionality that underlies innovative inclusion? Wow, absolutely, Sarah. So. Um... As some of you know, because you've been following our work, um, Inclusive Innovation is a major initiative here at One Schoolhouse, and um, we have upstaffed, so we are really focused on that work, particularly in instructional design, um, supporting our teachers in, in inclusive innovation. And I think how I want to answer your question, Sarah, is to, if you will, take a little field trip with me. Um, we're going to go back and we're going to meet Ben. Ben was the student who almost did me in as a 23 year old teacher and we all have a Ben. So those of you who've been around for a while, you may need to uh, dig into the recesses of your memory to find Ben or maybe he's just still right there with you. He follows you around. But there are those children and they're harder to manage 
when you're a young teacher and you have a narrower skill set, but there are always those children for whom um, no matter what you do, you're not connecting with them. They struggle in your class. They make teaching hard for you and you want to reach them. You're well-intended, but you just don't have all the tools in your toolbox. And so um, I have often over my years in education gone back to Ben and what Ben taught me, maybe what I wasn't able to teach Ben. And when you think about online learning, and I think a lot of teachers in independent schools certainly experienced this over the last year, there's some element of every single child that's been once you get online, right? And so there are things that in the moment, live in your classroom, you can account for, cover up, ignore, because you have so many things going on at once. And teachers are amazing multitaskers and they can manage a lot of different things at once. And maybe sometimes even be covering up for learning that's not happening or not happening well, because they have great classroom management skills and they just keep everyone moving forward regardless of how much deep learning is or is not happening. And, you know, the bends notwithstanding, you just kind of go through the year. Well, what we found out over the last year is that online learning surfaces those issues and they stay there they actually wind up being the cream on top. And so the ability for a teacher to handle those struggles and address them really competently has become an essential. It's become an actual outcome of the crisis distance learning that we've done. Because now those things are visible. A student is not thriving and they don't thrive for a myriad of different reasons, but the answer all around, whether you're back in person or still online, the answer is what we call inclusive innovation. It's the ability to meet each child where they are and let their learning needs drive the curriculum instead of the content or what the teacher wants to teach driving the curriculum. So that is the foundation of what we describe as inclusive innovation. Wow, that's really powerful, Kareen. And, um... I just want to mention that your findings and your research in this area have also informed the development of the independent curriculum standards and in a way that I think the intent may have been there before in some ways, but we've made it much more explicit. And so I would invite anyone participating in this webinar to jump on independentcurriculum.org and grab those standards if that's work that you're interested in doing. The other thing I really that I... Oh, go ahead. Nope. Okay. <laughs> what, what's so fun about the independent curriculum standards um, and the way that inclusive innovation is showing up in that language and that process is that um, I know we all kind of go in kind of a serpentine path on this work and teachers by their very nature are so drawn to any new tool or um, technique that will allow them to reach more of their students, especially the bends, right? And so over the years, we've trained up our faculty in um, things like personalized learning, social emotional learning, and now a lot of schools have a new thrust on DEIB. And when you, when you think about what's essential in all of those, it's really identity honoring work. And that is the cornerstone of advanced independent curriculum or independent curriculum is it's identity honoring work and teachers have to know who they are and how they show up. And they have to be able to honor the students and who their students are in their classroom. And so to me, there's sort of this synergy that's happening or about to happen right now in schools where teachers have gained a lot of new tools over the years um, and some they didn't even want to have to gain last year, but um, but I think it's all going to kind of come together. And especially when you all are back on campus, if you aren't yet, I think you're going to realize that now instead of feeling like these are disparate initiatives, they come together. And for us, they're coming together around advanced independent curriculum. I think that is exactly right. 
and, and the way that comes together. Um, I'm gonna drop a link in the chat and then I welcome anybody to share resources in the chat or if you've got a question um, to put them in the Q&A. But last week, or actually it was a couple of weeks ago, I interviewed Tom Rashan from the ERB and he also talked a little bit about students who did well and some students who have grown more than we would have expected. And he pointed out that academic leaders may wanna ask some questions on campus about some of these strong students. And Karine, I'd love to hear some of your thoughts around that. Some of those students who are really kicking it during the online learning. Yeah, <laughs> some of our students are really thriving. And um, as Tom let us know, they are students who know how to do school well on the one hand, but then there's kind of also this subset and we saw it not only in students, but also in teachers. There's folks who maybe are introverts and they are worn down by all that happens in school every day. And the ability to have a little more flexibility with their time, maybe manage some of their interactions so that there's more one-on-one -on -one instead of group um, has allowed them to really thrive. The other thing that I think has happened, and there's, some, there's an equity piece of this work, is that for students who can cover up maybe some holes that they have, um, they've been able to really get the support that they need. So there have been structurally with the crisis distance learning model, there wound up being built in more one-on-one -on -one time for teachers and students. And I really hope that that's one of the pieces of online learning that is here to stay. That teachers and students have now learned how to connect for more one-on-one -on -one time. And I know a lot of us have, a lot of schools have tutorial built into their schedule and students can come by and get a little office hour time with their teachers. But here at One Schoolhouse, as many of you know, we don't run live classes. And so our program is asynchronous. That doesn't mean that students don't meet regularly with their teachers. In fact, so regularly that some of them have standing weekly meetings with their teachers. And that is an element of what has long been our practice that a lot of schools adopted during the crisis distance learning time that I think and hope is gonna stay because there are students who really need that one-on-one -on -one interaction with their teachers and it has raised their, their Luxile scores. It has closed gaps in math that were small in the beginning, but have just been problematic all along. Um, I think it's helping students really thrive in ways that um, the deficit was more invisible to us because they were limping along. You know, it also raises one of the myths about online learning, which is that um, it's kind of the robots are coming to take our job myth. <laughs> I did not uh, allude, or not, I don't mind alluding to it, but I don't want to give much credence to it. Because, well, can you just say what the average class size is for us with online learning? Because I don't know and I should know it. Sorry. Yes, <laughs> our average this year is 17. Okay. And so one of the myths about online learning is that teachers are teaching hundreds of students and really just behind the scenes sort of auto grading. And I think that really speaks to what you just said, really speaks to one of the powers of online learning, which is that teacher student connection and that flexibility and, and the power of that. Mm -hmm. So I don't want teachers to lose that either. And I don't want schools to lose that. That's the truth that I was having a conversation last week with one of our teachers. And um, when I say our class average is 17 students, keep in mind the vast majority of our teachers, that's the only class they teach with us. So it's not like 17 times five or four, it's 17 full stop. Um, but I was talking with one of our teachers, she's a language teacher in a school in Texas. And she was sharing with me that one of the most powerful things of, that has come out of distance learning for her, she's back in school full time, but she is still meeting with students and their parents. These are not one schoolhouse students. These are students in her face-to-face -face school. She's still holding parent-teacher conferences virtually. And she said she has, she's a language teacher. So as you know, language teachers tend to teach the same students multiple years in a row, unlike some of the other subjects. So, she said she's met 
mothers who are working moms that she has taught their kid for four years and has never met the mom. Maybe all the other parent or a grandparent has always come to the in-person conference because it's at times that don't work for the family. And so she is feeling too like her ability to build that expansive village for the child has increased with her new online tools. I love that. Um, so I'm gonna share a slide here and I'm just gonna full disclosure, it's a webinar that was done by the Chronicle of Higher Ed and I just took a screenshot from the slideshow. And so, but I made clear that this is not my slide. Sarah did not do this research, all of that before I share it. So I hope everybody will humor me a little bit on that. And um, here is this. And I, I think what's most interesting about this is they did a, a study and they looked at college students and high school students. And this slide is about the high school students because I thought that was most relevant for our group here. But over 400 high school students from across the country, some who were experiencing fully remote learning, some who were in schools that had gone back to school and some at schools that were doing you know, the balance of the, of the two concurrent teaching. And just over half of the high school students reported that they expected that most of their college courses would have an online component. Doesn't mean that they would be taking all online courses, but that there would be some aspect of their coursework that would be online. And that seems really powerful to me, given that the online learning that most high school students experienced this year wasn't intentional, it wasn't necessarily sought. I mean, we like to remind everybody that our students wanted to take a course online and our teachers want to teach online. And that's a part of that. So Corrine, I'd love to know your take on this. Well, at one schoolhouse, since we started as the online school for girls 11 years ago, we have always used the language that online learning is a college readiness competency. So we have always felt like, um, well, <laughs> number one, we've always felt like high school teachers are better designers than college professors. And there's plenty of data to back that up. But I think one of the things that happens in independent schools is that in spite of how great of designers independent school teachers can be, there tends to be a safety to the different strategies that they use. And so when a child goes through, and some of the kids in our schools are there pre-K through 12th grade, when a child goes through an independent school education, they are really good at doing school by the time they are seniors. And the things that we have to do in independent schools in order to push our juniors and seniors to be uncomfortable, which we all know you only learn new things when you're a little bit uncomfortable. The things we have to push them to do are big, right? We got to send them out to internships. We've got to send them off to do an uh, international trip. Like, like it's hard to get them uncomfortable on our campus anymore. And online learning still has that potential. It still allows even students who do school really well to have that moment of, I'm not sure how to do this. Are my skills up to this task? Do I have to build? Do I have to expand in my executive functioning? Do I have to spend some cognitive energy on managing my time in a way that I am not used to at my school? And so let's be honest, it's not about the technology. Any any kid can find their way around an LMS. It is truly the, I have to manage myself a little bit differently to be successful in this space. And that to me is what is so powerful about online learning for students. And so um, Sarah, I know you've talked a lot about how the learning that students are doing now is really valuable and is gonna send students off to college in ways that they are prepared for college slightly differently. And so to me, that's the power of students expect to be online when they're in college and now they have more tools in their toolbox to handle it. So I'm going to stop sharing that. I left it up long enough that if anybody else happened to have, you know, a, an image grabbing tool at their disposal, hopefully you got that because it's not my slide and so I can't share it afterwards. Um, we're getting some questions in and I want to just 
Kareen, re respond for a moment to what you just said, because developmentally, students may be learning lessons too that they're not quite ready for. And so I think we need to, to practice a little bit of what we preach about it's okay to fail. And there may be kids who really stumbled with some executive functioning this year in ways that, depending on how their school operates, um, are, are gonna demonstrate some hits on a transcript or on a record. And yet they've grown and developed in other ways that, that we haven't measured yet accurately for them, but that will serve them well going forward. Yeah. Emily Silverman shared a couple of really good links and Emily, they just came to the panelists and I know Emily does some really interesting work coaching teaches, teachers. So Emily, if you wanted to um, reshare that in the chat to all panelists and attendees, that would be fantastic. And then we've also got some um, a share here from our head of school about the students taking online courses in college and how many of them do that. So if you'll just click on the two box and make sure that it says panelists and attendees, that, that's how that will go there. And then we've got a couple of questions coming in. If you will use the Q&A for your questions, it's just a little bit easier for me to manage that way. But this first question, Corrine, is one that you and I have been talking about a lot. And it is, how do we ask teachers to assess and adjust online learning for next year? How do, they, how do we ask them to think about what happened this year and plan going forward when what they really wanna do this summer is recover and go back to normal next year? <laughs> yeah, um, well, the first thing to do is we need to purge the word go back to normal because that's not acceptable. And you, know, you can read any of 17 articles about that from experts that know a lot more about it than I do, but We've learned some things over the past year in terms of um, tools and student support that are essential to integrate. And we've also learned that um, we don't want to go back to a normal that was not inclusive. And so there's really important equity and belonging work to be done around creating the culture you need to have a healthy school environment for learning for all students and faculty. So, so the first thing is that there's no going back to normal. Um, the plan for that, however, I think ranges and it depends on the school community and how assessment is done. Um, I know when we first switched to, when schools first switched to distance learning last spring, we just got tons of questions about assessment and what we learned from all the questions that we got is that really broadly speaking, a lot of teachers were assessing what they taught rather than assessing what students learned. And so it, as I talked about at the beginning, it sudden, a, a deficiency suddenly became really obvious, which is that the assessments practices that we were using weren't really telling us how much students were growing and mastering the essential competencies of our curriculum. So um, I feel like you asked me two questions, Sarah, and I'm going to segue into the second one, which is how do we get teachers, how do we help teachers assess for learning loss or assess for learning gains in a year when, man, they need downtime and fresh air and less screen time. And I'm going to say two things about that. The first is ask. Your students and your teachers are reservoirs of data and they have great observational practices. So the data that you can gather from your students about what they've learned, what they've gained, what they feel they've lost, and from your teachers, and if you ask them of the similar questions, you can aggregate the data and run a few simple regressions and see how those things measure up. But your teachers are lifelong learners and they're passionate about serving their students. And so I think there's great opportunity to do some thought work this summer. And you know, certainly there are plenty of resources and classes that teachers can take, but there are also opportunities for teachers to just think expansively. And I would say now is the perfect time to ask teachers to rethink assessment. And there's so many different ways that you can tackle how they know and asking them how they know what their students learned. And um, I brought some object lessons here. 
So if you're thinking about how do we measure what we've learned and how do we change going forward so that God forbid this happens again, we know what students are gaining and losing. And if you haven't started talking about project-based learning, setting the standard for project-based learning in your school, if you don't think expansively about your strategy, like emergent strategy, not things that are necessarily school oriented, but things that help you know how to move forward, what your students are. If you haven't read Under Pressure by Lisa Damore, I know it's been out for a few years, but it's a Bible for helping students be safe and grow. Um, I think Tim mentioned last week, this is this book mm -hmm. um, by John McTie, Jay McTie, Teaching for Deeper Learning. Like there are plenty of really simple resources out there that can help teachers and schools move their curriculum, shift what you're measuring and valuing going into next year. Yeah, and if you don't happen to be on the academic leaders listserv, I cannot encourage enough joining that because there's a conversation going on right now about assessment and course exemptions and you know, how we're going to think about that assessment. And Karine, you've been touching on a question that we got, but I wanna read it out loud and make sure that we really address it. How do we offer our thoughts on that tension between meeting children where they are and having that drive the curriculum? And then our, you know, Jonathan talks here about college admissions expecting applicants to have a standard curriculum. And I think, you know, we've had some interviews with the directors of college counseling who have said, you know, students come from multiple areas in places of study. And we know that particularly a school that has students from, you know, a vast different um, geography is going to have students who have different backgrounds. But how do we reconcile maybe meeting each student where they are and our desired outcomes as a school? We have that portrait of a graduate. Well, this is a whole nother webinar, Sarah. <laughs> Well, I'm kind of thinking it is. <laughs> I'm, I'm feeling like it is, but there's no short answer, Jonathan. But what we do know is that the, the mindset and the ability to tackle problems, communicate effectively, um, defend a position, use data to analyze, um, write with authority, like some of these competencies that come out of our high school classes are the things that predict college success. And so you might need to call the course biology, but what you teach in that course doesn't have to be content or textbook driven the way it used to be. And so here at One Schoolhouse, we think really broadly in independent curriculum about what are the competencies that students need coming out of this course? And then how do we backfill with the content <clears throat> that will build the passion and build the skills? Um, so, I, you know, I go back to a lot. Uh oh. So, I think. Um... We will get Kareem back in a minute. I hope actually we're at the end of our webinar time here anyway. And one of the things that I was thinking about when when Kareem was talking earlier is that we are all Sarah. very much up. Oh, you're back. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I was talking or if you were. I think it's you that froze, but I would never know. I'm not sure you were frozen for me and I think I was frozen for you. <laughs> right. I think it so, was, I apologize. Maybe they heard something about me. <laughs> I was really thinking about the fact that we're used to students coming into the room at the beginning of the school year and having to find out who this group of children are and, and, and who they maybe finish the school year as is, doesn't necessarily match who comes in in September and this year more than ever. But I also think the adults in the community as we are, in March, we all know that we aren't who we were in March 2020. And some reflective time this summer on how am I different 
is something that I think all of us leaders and faculty and students would be wise to spend some time in and thinking about how that helps us determine our path forward. And that's maybe a little over, overblown and over dramatic for a close here, but just wanted to share that thought. Karine, do you have anything else that you wanna share? I think our time is up today, but I would love to tackle Jonathan's question more deeply in a future webinar. So, and um, Jonathan, I hope that you um, have reached out too if you wanna schedule some time to, to talk. So, thank you all, everybody. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Bye-bye. <laughs>